Welcome everyone and thank you for taking this Monday morning in December to come and attend the very last event of the year that the Canada West Foundation is hosting here in 2022. Uh, we are excited to be bringing you uh, today's event, uh, but first a word about us in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, the Canada West Foundation is an independent, nonpartisan, uh, public policy think tank and we work on the issues that affect the West and by extension all of Canada. My name is Marla Orenstein. I'm the director of the Natural Resources Centre, and we'll be hearing a lot today from Brendan Cook, one of our senior policy analysts. Um, and we work a lot on energy issues and energy transition issues and things around energy and climate policy. So we have had a lot of things happen in this last year, and it's time for a roundup so we can take a look at the year in review. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Both the chat and the Q&A functions have been enabled. If you have questions that you wanna get answered, and we'll, we'll spend about probably the last 10 minutes or so uh, looking at questions that have come up, please put it in the Q&A. Um, that's where we will look for the questions. You may also put anything you want in the chat. That's more your comments, your observations. If you wanna let other people who are here know about something, chat is a great place for that. If you have a question for Brendan or for me, please put that in the Q&A. Uh, so again, we're talking about the federal energy and climate policy that's happened in 2022. We did one of these roundups about two or three years ago, and we were just stunned at the volume of information and how much had gone on in the year and how much had been happening. And all that has been not exactly rendered obsolete, but there's certainly been a lot of new stuff coming down in this last year. And so I'm going to turn it over to Brendan now, who's going to tell us about what are we going to see today? What are we going to talk about? And, and how's it all going to roll out? So Brendan? Over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so yes, we're going to touch on a uh, couple key developments, as Marla said. Um, nine of them are from 2022. Uh, and then we have a couple items at the end as well uh, to watch for in 2023. So yeah, on the screen now um, is, is kind of a, a general agenda of what we're going to go through today. Um, the first item that I do want to talk about today, though, is the 2030 Emission Reduction Plan. Um, that was put forward by the federal government in March this year. A couple of reasons to start with this plan uh, before anything else. Uh, the One of those being that this is the first uh, emissions reduction plan that has been released under the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, um, which in and of itself makes it a bit of a big deal. Um, we are going to see future plans uh, under this act as well released for uh, targets for 2035, 2040, 2045, and 2050. Um, uh, but but with this one being the first, uh, it's really just kind of setting the stage for what we can expect from, from some of those future iterations as well. Um, this is also the first time we've seen a, we've seen all of the government thinking really about the same thing at the same time and bringing all of that together into one single plan for, for realizing some, some fairly short-term goals with those all being by 2030. Um, we had healthy environment, healthy economy plan that came out in 2020. Um, and we've had the pan-Canadian framework that came out in 2016, uh, but neither of those was really as robust as this one is, and both were looking at plans that were 30 and 15 years into the future, not really the short-term objectives that we see now. Uh, and then the final reason to, to really start with this is that a lot of the other items that we're going to talk about today um, were either directly mentioned or foreshadowed uh, within this uh, 2030 emission reduction plan. Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details of this. The plan is close to 300 pages long. It could be a webinar in and of itself. Um, but essentially what it does is outline actions that are already underway for emission reductions and then uh, those that are planned for the future as well. Um, all of those with the goal of reducing emissions by 40 to 45% um, below 20, uh, 2005 levels um, by 2030 um, and achieving ultimately a net zero economy by 2050. When we were going over this before, Brendan, I was joking that the Canada West Foundation's new motto should be, we read the 300 page report, so you don't have to. Exactly. That's right. Um, the, the other uh, interesting thing about this one is that it really takes a sector by sector approach um, to, to setting those targets. Um, it focuses on the 10 sectors that are up on the slide here now um, and really establishes plans and uh, emission reduction opportunities for each of those individually. Um, and so, yeah, as a result of taking that that sector deep dive approach, um, it gets a lot um, a lot deeper into the the specific actions that each industry segment can take um, when you compare that to some of those prior plans I mentioned that take more of a whole of the economy approach. Um, 
So along with this plan, we did get uh, a whack of new funding as well. So uh, $9.1 billion to be exact. Um, while that sounds like a lot of money, it's not quite to the same scale as some of the more recent announcements that we've seen um, and some that we'll talk about today as well. Uh, but nonetheless, when you have funding accompanying these plans, that's always a good thing. Um, so again, I'm, <laughs> similar to the last one, I'm not going to go into through all of the funding, but you can kind of see the rough breakdown on the slide now um, in terms of which sectors are getting how much. Uh, the one that I will call out specifically is transportation, just because it's taking you know, a little over 30% of the overall funding with $2.9 billion. Um, and the main uh, direction that that's being uh, put towards is both to incent uh, electric vehicle or net zero vehicle um, adoption, uh, as well as building out some EV charging infrastructure. So, Brendan, this, this plan sets out the decarbonization targets for the different sectors that, that we've listed here. Can you tell me, are these hard targets that each sector must comply with, or is it a sort of a general wish list and general direction of travel, or is it a bit of each? Yeah, it's, I'd, I'd say it's a little bit of each. Um, it really depends on what sector you're talking about in terms of, of how those, those targets have been established. Um, for oil and gas and for the electricity sector specifically, uh, throughout the plan, there are some pretty clear indications uh, that regulations are coming, uh, and we will be touching on those momentarily. Um, but for most of the other sectors, these are remaining pretty soft voluntary targets. Fantastic. Well, you've segued us nicely to, to our next uh, topic, which is going to be the, the oil and gas cap there. What can you tell us about, about this? Yeah, so oil and gas cap was one of the, the bigger announcements that we had this year. Um, and, and one, as I mentioned, that was foreshadowed in that 2030 uh, reduction plan. Um, the proposed, it, ultimately, it's a, it's a proposed cap on upstream oil and gas emissions. Um, the, this all came out through a discussion paper that was released by the federal government in July this year. They put forward two different options for, for what could be used to cap emissions at 40. The, the target is 42% below 2019 levels by 2030. Um, and so they put forward those two options and, and we're looking for, for feedback on, on what folks thought of each. Uh, the first option is a national cap and trade system um, that would end up being developed under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Uh, under that option, a, cap, uh, a full cap would be set for the national emissions from the industry and then emission allowances would then be either assigned through um, free, free allocations that, that facilities would just be given by the government, and then also allowance auctions where you could purchase additional um, emission allowances. Uh, facilities would then use those um, to uh, offset their, their obligations, and, and they would also be allowed to use compliance offset credits to, to further reduce their, their emission obligations. Um, this cap and trade system, I should say, would not necessarily replace um, any of the existing regulations that we have for GHG emissions. Um, whether it be the OBPS or the clean fuel standard or the methane regulations that we have now, um, none of those would go away under this. This would just be an, uh, another regulation in addition to those existing systems. Um, the second option that we have is... Already, um, this just adds to it on top of those things. You have the emissions, so it will add something incremental, but it won't replace them. Is that right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, another another regulation to deal with for the industry. Uh, nothing nothing going away under that option. Um, the uh, the second option that they put forward though is a modified uh, a modified version of the existing carbon pricing regulation that we have um, that would essentially put into place special requirements for that upstream oil and gas uh, uh, industry. Um, under that option, an emission reduction trajectory would end up being set for the entire sector. Uh, and then a carbon price would be set to incent emission reductions in line with that, that trajectory that was established. Uh, the sector would, in that case, then, uh, if it's on track to meet the, the emission reduction target under the trajectory, prices, nothing really changes. Prices would con stay consistent with the OBPS and the full economy uh, carbon uh, tax. If, however, they, the sector is deemed to not be on track to what that trajectory is aiming at, um, then a sector-specific carbon price would be implemented um, so you would see upstream oil and gas having a different carbon price than the rest of the economy um, to then try to bring them back on track with that trajectory. Um, I should mention too, under the second option that because of the, the way that the provincial systems are set up um, and the requirements for them to, to uh, be allowed, it, they have to be in, in line with the, the federal backstop under OBPS. And so 
um, systems like Tier in Alberta would end up having to set a sector specific price as well to, to remain uh, compliant. And just to be clear, we're talking about A or B, right? It, this, this isn't both, this is the government's gonna choose one or the other to implement as the gas cap? That's right, yeah. So, so yeah, two options being put forward, but ultimately we're just gonna see one of those being implemented. I've I've heard some different opinions from different sectors as to or not sectors but but agents then as to which option they prefer. Brendan, which option do you think they're actually going to go for in the end? Yeah, so I think as you mentioned, pr preference really depends on on who you're talking to on this one. Um, I think ultimately they're probably going to go the route of option two, the the adapted carbon tax. Um, I don't think either option is really going to be popular if you're talking to folks in Western Canada or, or in the oil and gas uh, uh, sector. But um, but I think option two is, is where they're going to end up going. It's it's a lot more straightforward uh, and it, it really relies on the system that's already in place and a system that has to a large degree already won out in the courts. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, I've also heard a lot of people say it's actually a production cap in disguise. Is that what it's supposed to be? And is that what it actually is? Yeah, so that is one of the big concerns that, that has been raised by industry. Um, I can say throughout the, the discussion document that they released, it was stressed quite heavily that this is not a production cap, this is an emission cap. Um, however, I think the, those there is a fear that, that this could ultimately impact production. I mean, cutting production is probably the most straightforward way to, to reduce your emissions. And so if we don't see some of the technology pathways panning out um, that, that a lot of companies are, are planning to, to put into place, uh, there is that risk that this could turn into a production cap. Fantastic. Well, that's one that that we're certainly going to keep our eye on as as we move into 2023. So let's let's move our attention to something actually quite different. Um, if I can go in the right direction, there, a the fertilizer emissions reduction targets. So we're moving from upstream oil and gas over to agriculture. And what can you tell us about this? Yeah. So this one, I guess, is kind of kind of proof that there is no industry that is immune to climate targets now. Um, uh, so the, yeah, the federal government uh, released another discussion paper uh, this year addressing what will is a proposed national target to reduce GHG emissions, um, specifically nitrous oxide uh, from fertilizer application. Um, and so the, the targeted reduction would be 30% uh, below 2020 levels by 2030, which would end up being equivalent to about four megatons of CO2. Again, it, it would end up mostly being a reduction in nitrous oxide, but it would have a four megaton CO2 equivalent uh, reduction factor. Yeah, and let's be clear about, so what exactly is this emissions reduction target from fertilizer? Does it have to do with the production of fertilizer? Is it other things on the farm as well, such as the emissions from the tractors that you're using when you're applying the fertilizer? Or is it is it just the fertilizer itself? Yeah, so this one is just associated with that release of, again, mainly uh, nitrogen, um, nitrous oxide uh, into the atmosphere strictly from the application of fertilizers. So something that, you know, if you're using too much fertilizer uh, and that nitrogen leaches out uh, and gets into the atmosphere, that's what this one's talking about. So this is going to end up falling pretty squarely on farmers to, to meet this reduction. Um, it, it's not going to have really an impact on heavy industry or, or the transportation sector at all. Mm -hmm. um, I should also say too that there, there was a lot less complexity in this paper compared to the, the oil and gas cap. Um, you didn't see those same kind of multiple compliance options being given. This one was much more of just um, guidelines on how those reductions might end up being reached. Uh, uh, so really what they've put forward is that the intention for this would really be to mainly reach that four megaton reduction through what they're calling the four R principles, um, which is applying the right uh, source of fertilizer at the right rate, at the right time, and in the right places. Um, they've put forward a few other suggested practices, mainly around starting to replace synthetic fertilizers with more natural solutions like manure or compost, um, as well as trying to just limit the nitrogen content in those synthetic fertilizers. Uh, or doing some soil testing before applying um, nutrients to, to make sure you're putting them where they're needed. And is this one, in terms of its compliance, is it more of a hard regulatory compliance farmers absolutely have to do this? Or is this more of a soft target, possibly with some carrots attached to it rather than sticks? Yeah, I think this is one of those soft target ones. Uh, so we haven't really seen any strict regulations hinted at this one. Uh, that being said, uh, it did still get quite a considerable amount of backlash from the farming community, um, mainly citing what the costs of implementing this might look like. Um, 
and and that being a or the what's making the cost high for them really is the high potential for for something like this to reduce the yields that they're seeing from their field um, and there's some concerns too with what a reduced yield means during a time of of uh, some concerns around global food shortages um, there some folks did put forward some some more technical concerns as well mainly around what the measuring and monitoring practices would look like for this uh, and what what the availability of accurate data looks like right now so you know, this being a, it, it's much more difficult to try to measure the emissions from each individual farm than it is for, for large industries like oil and gas. So this would really result in, in soil testing on, on a whole lot of fields. And um, there's some, there's some concerns that even if we met, met this kind of a reduction target, it'd be difficult to prove that, that we did. And, and when you're talking about measurements on farms, you're talking more theoretically that that's how it would have to be done. That's not what you're saying the federal government's plans actually are. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. That's great. Well, it's certainly one that has has raised a lot of um, discussion among the farmers. And in fact, Canada West Foundation, we had a whole a whole webinar on this, which you are welcome to go to our website and take a look at. Let's move over uh, once again to another area. In this case, the clean electricity regulations. We're popping all over the place here. Yeah, so uh, you might know the clean electricity regulations, I guess, from, from their prior name. Um, so when these were first introduced, they were called the, the clean electricity standard. Um, I'm not totally sure on what the, the reason for the name changes. If someone knows, uh, maybe throw it into the chat. I'd love to love to hear. Um, but, but something to note is that there is going to be, with the clean electricity regulations, it's being referred to as the CER as well. So there's going to be another CER acronym floating around in, in the electricity space. Um, which is likely to cause a little bit of confusion, uh, mainly because this is not a regulation from the Canadian Energy Regulator or the CER. This is coming from ECCC. Um, so what this really is setting out, though, is an overall target of Canada as a whole reaching a net zero grid by the year 2035. Can you tell me about what, what the mechanism is proposed to get us to that target of a net zero grid by 2035? So, so for this one, um, there's there's two primary mechanisms that have been suggested. Um, one being an emission emissions intensity standard that would be applied to power generating facilities, um, and then a fin financial compliance requirement as well. And so, how that would work is plants that have emissions intensities above that that standard that is set, which is likely to be set somewhere around zero, but not zero. Um, so it'll be probably in line with something like high performing uh, gas generating facilities with CCS attached. Um, if you end up having your emission intensity above that standard, your facility will just not be allowed to operate at all. Um, and then for facilities that have emissions below that, um, then you have to, to make up the difference between zero and that, that nearly zero number um, through either purchasing offset credits or or paying a, a price equivalent to the carbon tax per ton. Okay, so, so that's the mechanism. Let's talk for a minute about what facilities it applies to. Is it going to apply to all electricity producers? And when, when does it start? Would it start immediately? Yeah, so that's, I guess, something that's still evolving a little bit on this one. Um, but the details we've seen so far shows that I think there is going to be some flexibility on exactly what happens right away on this. Uh, so the frame for this regulation was released in August, and based on that, we've seen it suggested that uh, small capacity facilities um, and facilities that are not actually attached to a regulated electricity grid would be exempt from the requirements of this regulation. Uh, it also suggests that facilities that are commissioned prior to 2025 would be exempt from the regulation up until their prescribed end of life, which is likely to be some short period of time after 2035. Um, and then uh, the other exemption is that any facility that is required to operate during a time of emergency um, would also be exempt from, from the emission uh, requirements of this. So it does, some of that does alleviate some of the concerns that, that I know were out there around what this might do, how this might impact um, existing natural gas fire generation, um, and also um, the potential impacts it might have on, on more remote communities. Um, that being said, I think there are still some pretty key definitions that need to be worked out here. Uh, the first being what is considered small. Um, we don't actually have a megawatt size on what a small generating facility would look like. Um, we also don't have a, a strict definition on what that prescribed end of life looks like. It's likely to be some period of time from 
a fixed period of time from the first day that that facility started producing electricity. Um, but we don't exactly know what that looks like yet. Uh, and then the other interesting thing is, is there's been suggestions around fleet averaging that this, that this would maybe not necessarily per, uh, be applied per facility, but it might be applied on an average to, to a company's given fleet. Um, and so that's interesting, but we need to kind of get some more information on that as well, because what that looks like in Alberta, where we have a lot of small generating, um, or not small generating facilities, but a lot of, a lot of companies with a smaller fleet, um, that looks a lot different in Alberta than it would in BC or Manitoba, where you have a large crown corporation that essentially owns um, the entire fleet of generating assets in the province. Well, we have um, two small questions here that, that, um, that have been, are going to be pretty easy to answer right now. One is... Sure. Does it apply to off-grid remote mines? No. Yeah. So, so anything off-grid, as as the frame stands right now, would be exempt from this. And the other one is: Can you elaborate on not being able to operate if it's below us or above a certain threshold? What does that mean? It it means just that you cannot run the facility. So so you might end up in a situation where you have facilities that that do have emission um, emission intensity above that that standard and those would only then be allowed to operate in in a time of emergency so power you know some some unabated gas facilities or, or something of that nature that might be kept around just in case um, there's a need on on a you know power outages or a really cold day or, or something depending on what they define emergency as as well um, but otherwise cannot operate means cannot operate those are all going to get shut down so I, I suspect that this is one that is going to, like others, land up in court following the footsteps of the carbon tax, the Impact Assessment Act. And for the same reason, it's the boundary of uh, between what's provincial and what's federal jurisdiction. What do you think? Are we going to wind up with a court case around the, the clean electricity regulations? Yeah, I, I, I think I would agree with that uh, as well. I mean, in, in the discussion paper, they were pretty forthcoming about the fact that this, this would need an all of government um, approach and cooperation really between those different levels of government to make this happen. Um, but that being said, there, there are some pretty cl clear constitutional concerns being raised, mainly as, as you mentioned, that this is an overstep of, of the federal government into the electricity sector, which is a sector that's under provincial jurisdiction. So yeah, I, I'd agree. I don't, I don't really see any path on this one that doesn't lead to the courts. Yeah, this is a fascinating one. I'm seeing more questions that are coming in, which I think we're, we're going to hold to the end because they're good questions and move on to the next thing on our list here, which is also a long one, um, which is the CCUS or carbon uh, capture utilization and storage tax credit. It's a big one. What do we have to say about it? Yeah, so as, as I'm sure a lot of the folks on the on the call here or the, the webinar here today um, already know, uh, carbon capture and storage is, is a tool that is likely going to play um, a pretty major role in getting to any of these targets, regardless of sector, um, and, and kind of reaching those plans and, and meeting these regulations that, that we're talking about today. Um, that being said, I think a lot of folks are also pretty well aware that the economics for really developing carbon capture and storage right now um, they're they're not quite there. Uh, so so this carbon capture uh, investment tax credit is really something that was put forward by the federal government to combat that um, that mismatch in the economics right now. And so uh, this was first put forward in budget 2022, um, and it's it's kind of the first broadly applicable carrot in what has been a fairly stick heavy carbon policy environment in Canada. Um, so the credit itself would end up being a refundable tax credit uh, that would cover the purchase and installation of eligible equipment for carbon capture utilization and storage projects. Um, and it would be, you'd be able to get that credit on expenses starting January 1st, 2022. So, so any development this year would already be covered under this. Well, when we initially read through the, the document, we were thinking it was only applicable in Alberta and Saskatchewan, but is that correct? Yeah, so so partially. So there's there's two types of carbon storage uh, projects that are eligible for the credit right now, um, and those are one being uh, projects that store CO two in a ded dedicated geological formation, um, and the second being projects that use CO two in the making of concrete. Um, and so for the geological storage op option, we were right. <laughs> the uh, the, the tax credit is really just limited to Alberta and Saskatchewan right now. 
Um, and that's mainly due to the fact that Alberta and Saskatchewan have an existing regulatory regime that um, that enables this, uh, whereas the other provinces and territories aren't quite there with, with their uh, regulations yet. Um, however, for use in concrete, um, those projects would be eligible across the country. Um, no ge geographical uh, constraints on that one. What, what about the other things you can do with captured carbon, though? I mean, for example, you don't have to put it in concrete. You could put it in a box and stick it in a warehouse and it sits there nice and inertly. Or you can use it to make renewable fuels, for example. Are, are these allowed at all under the legislation as or the regulations as they're proposed? Yeah, so as of right now, they are not allowed. It's just those two types of projects that are eligible right now. But I would say that I... I for those types of projects, I would say it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't be allowed at some point in time. Um, so each method of carbon sequestration or carbon utilization needs to get the rubber stamp from ECCC. Um, and really what they're looking at is a couple different criteria, but mainly they're looking to prove that that method provides permanent storage. Um, and they're also looking to ensure that the carbon that is stored, uh, specifically in like a utilization type project that when you store the carbon in a product that that carbon isn't then re-released when the product is used down the road. Mm -hmm. Well, let's also talk about the big elephant in the room, which is EOR or enhanced oil recovery. Um, it's not available for EOR. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And, and EOR, so EOR is considered an ineligible use. Um, and I think unlike some of those other examples that you gave earlier, we, sh we should not expect EOR to become eligible in the future. Um, this one was laid out pretty clearly in the plan um, that EOR does not qualify. I know that's had some people pretty upset, and I, I can sort of think of two possible reasons that EOR isn't included. The first is pure ideology. The federal government does not want to do anything that would um, have people taking up more um, oil and gas production. But a second one, a, a different possibility, is that this new credit is there to help offset the financial costs of new projects. And EOR is already a way to use CCUS to make money. That's why it's been going on for years and years. Um, it doesn't need the financial enhancement in order for there to be an economic case for, for uh, carbon to be sequestered in an EOR project. Um, which of these two do you think is the reason? Yeah, I, I think I can see both sides of that. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, these projects are already being developed. They they didn't need the credit to make the business case for EOR. Um, but I can also kind of see the the, the argue, argument of the folks who are a little bit upset about it not being included as well. And, and I think that argument is that uh, we've been doing these projects in Canada for a long time. Um, we have a lot of experience in it. And so if we're trying to get uh, CCUS projects up and running very quickly, these are some projects that we likely could get up and running much faster than, than some of those other options. So I think both both the uh, the reasons for why you said this isn't being included are probably both true to some extent, um, but I can also see the side of the, of the folks who, who would like to see it included as well. We Fair should enough. mention too, though, that, that this doesn't mean that your project can't do EOR at all. Um, what it, what it, the, the frame for this is saying is that if you have EO, if, if you're gonna end up sending any of your CO2 to an EOR project, you need to lay that out in the project plan right from the beginning. Um, and then the, the credit that you would receive would be proportional to the, the eligible uses of CO2 that you have. So if you're sending 50% to an EOR project and 50% to one of the eligible uses, you would, you would get the, the credit proportional to that. That's the credit. How much of an incentive is actually being offered and, and how, how does that compare to what's being offered in the U.S. under their tax credit program that's called 45Q? Yeah, so, so if you were to assume that your project was 100% eligible, um, that credit rate right now is set at 60% um, for a direct air capture project, 50% uh, for one of those two eligible types that, that we talked about earlier, um, and uh, then 37.5% for, for equipment that would be involved not in the capture, but in the transportation and storage of, of CO2. Um, and so those rates as they stand now would then be reduced by half after 2030. And then the, the credit disappears entirely in 2040. Um, and so that kind of staged approach is really to try to incentivize um, more rapid development in the, in the, the sector. Um, now compared to 45Q, as you mentioned, uh, I, from what I had seen, it was 
fairly close to being equivalent to 45Q before the Inflation Reduction Act came into place this summer. Um, that being said, there are very different mechanisms. So the investment tax credit in Canada um, is a subsidy for the upfront capital costs of the project, um, whereas 45Q works more as a production uh, subsidy um, mm -hmm. that would give you essentially a guaranteed return per ton of CO2 sequestered. So ours is upfront. Um, the U.S., their, their tax credit comes as the, the facility continues to operate. Um, so depending on, on the project and, and I guess on who you talk to, there's, there's benefits and, and disadvantages to each of those. Um, the other thing to mention, too, is that 45Q does also include EOR, um, whereas we mentioned that uh, the Canadian uh, credit does not. So that is another advantage uh, for the U.S. really in, in trying to attract investment to these kinds of projects. Fantastic. Well, this is one that I think that you and I could talk about for, if not the entire webinar, possibly months and years. And I suspect we're going to be doing quite a bit of work on this in 2023 so. as well. So if you're interested in this topic, tune back to our website. Let's move on to the next topic, though, which is the uh, Federal Greenhouse Gas Offset Credit Registry. If I can possibly move the... Bit of a mouthful. It is. It is a bit of a mouthful. There we go. The Federal Carbon Registry. Let's just call it that. Yeah, so we've we've talked about um, offset credits in a few of these other plans as being mechanisms that could be used to reach the the reduction goals that that uh, companies will have to um, have to get to under these plans. Um, and so Alberta and BC have both had some form of a carbon carbon registry and some form of a, an offset market for for quite a while now, um, but there has not been that kind of a system at the national level. Mm -hmm. And so this. Uh, Canada's Federal Greenhouse Gas Offset Credit Registry um, was launched this summer. Um, it, it is a new countrywide system um, as opposed to the provincial systems. Um, and it's, it is another one of those key measures that came from that 2030 emission reduction plan. So the system will now give project developers that were in a jurisdiction without an offset system an opportunity to um, really incent the generation of carbon credits uh, to, to, to meet some of these emission reduction efforts. Um, however, the credits that are generated under this federal system have to be used to offset emissions from facilities that are also regulated under the federal system. Uh, and so what that means is that they won't be available to facilities operating under uh, a provincial carbon pricing system. So we will still see, for example, uh, credits that are used to offset obligations under tier in Alberta, that is going to stay the same. This is going to be something that's more implemented in the other provinces. What kinds of projects can collect offsets under the system now? So right now, there's only one protocol. Pro protocol is the word for, for the type of project that is eligible to generate credits. Um, so there's only one protocol right now available for um, projects, and that is for projects that are capturing and destroying methane from landfill sites. Um, there's a few others that are in development right now that just haven't been released quite yet. Uh, and those are for uh, improved forestry management, um, enhanced soil carbon sequestration, uh, livestock feed management, and for direct air capture and sequestration. Uh, interestingly, one thing that is not on the, the, the list of uh, protocols that's being developed right now is anything for that point source capture and sequestration of carbon. Um, it's not on the list at all, which is which. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting given that we have that investment tax credit and a lot of other programs right now that are trying to encourage uh, that widespread CCUS. Do you think the reason it's not on there is that additionality that there's so many other things that are that are pushing on that particular button that um, this isn't the the protocol that's needed? Yeah, it could be that that the funding that's going to come from the ITC. Um, yeah, removes that additionality factor that's that's required to generate an offset credit. Right. Let's move to mandatory climate disclosure. Boy, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah, so there has been a ton of talk about whether climate risk reporting or ESG reporting. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of been the, the talk of the town for the past couple of years. Um, but I think as of this year, we can officially say that mandatory climate risk disclosures are here. Um, and there's more coming down the, down the road for sure. So, so Canada announced um, this year that starting in 2024, federal uh, regulated financial institutions, which is essentially your, your banks and your insurance companies, 
um, will be required to report on their climate risk exposure. Um, and so while this, this rule right now just applies to federal institutions, uh, the, the government has noted that it's, it's, gonna, it's expecting there to be a bit of a trickle-down effect um, and this to kind of work its way into a lot of the businesses that rely on these financial institutions for support and, and that work closely with them. Um, in addition to that trickle-down effect, though, uh, there are some pretty, pretty concrete evidence that, that climate risk disclosure is also coming to publicly traded companies. Um, so the first is that in October last year, 2021, the Canadian Securities Administrators, or the CSA, uh, they published a proposed climate-related disclosure requirements, um, and that would be applicable to pub all publicly traded companies in Canada. Um, and so the new requirements that they've put forward were largely based on the TCFD framework or the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, one of those big um, global frameworks that's out there for, for this right now. Um, they really adapted those rules in what they would be, expect from Canadian companies. And then since then, this year, we also have seen the U.S. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC, um, has also issued their own proposed rules for, for climate-related disclosures for, from public companies. Um, and theirs are also based on the TCFD framework. And then after that, we also saw that the International Sustainability Standards Board, or the ISSB, these all have a ton of acronyms, um, they also put forward a draft framework that was, again, based on TCFD. So I think at this point, we're, we can be pretty clear that some form of uh, climate disclosure requirements is going to be coming for public companies, and whatever that is, is very likely to be based on TCFD. It seems like something that is going to place a big administrative burden on, on these public companies. Has anybody looked into what this will cost? Yeah, so so the SEC um, has put out an estimate. So I, I should also say, shameless plug, we we've done a, a few uh, reports on on ESG. So again, check check yeah. our website if you're interested in that. Um, we've got one report on the Canadian energy sector and ESG, and another on um, ESG and governments. And and while we were working on that ESG and governments report, um, we did come across that SEC estimate on on what this was going to end up costing companies. And so their estimate right now is for the average company. Um, that this would cost about six hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars annually, and that that's USD. Um, so that's your average. The bigger the company, the higher the cost. Um, but nonetheless, that that is a, a substantial um, operating cost that would be added onto companies if if this does come into into effect. I, I will say too that that our that second report on ESG and governments does have the figure from the SEC, but, but it was lower at the time. It was in the the low 500. So if you go looking for that number in our reports, you'll find it. But it, it's a slightly outdated number that this 677,000 a year supersedes it. Yeah. Well, let's let you know we've done a lot of talking about um, some of these things that are coming down the, the the pike in in Canada. Let's talk a little bit more about what's happening with the um, U.S. Inflation Reduction Act because again, it doesn't apply to us, but it certainly has implications for us. Yeah. So this one got a ton of news over the summer. Um, so yeah, U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, also called the or being called the IRA, um, so that was passed into law in August. As you said, not a Canadian um, piece of policy, but definitely something that is going to have some some pretty large impacts on Canadian uh, competitiveness. And there's a lot of folks that are expecting some form of a response from the Canadian government to this. Mm -hmm. um, so despite the name Inflation Reduction Act, this really is the largest piece of climate legislation in U.S. history. Uh, it was it deployed about $369 billion to uh, a variety of climate and energy programs, uh, mostly focused on reducing emissions um, from, from energy projects. Um, it's a pretty carrot-rich act um, compared to what we see in Canadian climate legislation, um, which is, as I mentioned, likely to have a pretty significant impact on Canadian competitiveness uh, into the future. The, the U.S. approach to this has really been a lot more on the side of encouraging invest investment in low emission uh, energy projects versus penalizing their existing oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as a result, with an act this large, um, I think it's over 700 pages long, uh, there is a ton of different pieces, a ton of different initiatives that are included. Um, we're not going to go through all of it. We're just going to chat quickly about a couple of the pieces that have uh, pretty big impacts on us here in Canada. Mm 
And so the first of those is uh, in, an investment in production tax credits that are being offered for the domestic production of a variety of energy products, um, including EVs, batteries, uh, wind turbines, solar cells. Um, and, and what's being considered domestic production under that is slightly flexible. So on some of the products, uh, for example, uh, the, the qualification for domestic EV production is that the batteries or the parts for that EV production have to be uh, made in either Canada or, or sorry, in either US or a free trade partner, um, which includes Canada. So that's good for us. Um, and also on the manufacturing side, that has to, the manufacturing itself has to happen in North America, which again means Canada could be included in, in some of those subsidies. Um, however, that being said, there are still better subsidies if you have your uh, operation located in the US. Um, and so that is likely to lead still to more manufacturing infrastructure being developed and built out uh, in the US as opposed to Canada ultimately. Um, the next big piece that we've kind of talked about a little bit already um, that's been getting a lot of attention is the, exp the expansion of the initiatives for carbon capture projects under that 45Q regulation that we were talking about earlier. Um, and so essentially what they've done is they've, um, they've made the credit available for longer, they've made it available for smaller facilities, and they've increased what the value of that credit is. And so under the new um, 45Q as a result of the IRA, um, direct air capture projects can receive up to $180 per ton of sequestration. And then there's varying levels down to $60 per ton um, for uh, uses at which in, so utilization projects with do, which does include EOR uh, and so at those prices the IRA um, make really does make locating a carbon capture project in the U.S. far more attractive than than locating in Canada right now I think some of the estimates were that the Canadian um, tax incentive would have to get up to 80 85 percent um, for it to become equivalent to the IRA again. Yeah. So it sounds to me like it, overall, this is going to potentially have the result of, of impacting Canadian competitiveness by drawing investment down to the U.S. and away from Canada. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, there, there's been a little bit of talk already of, of some projects kind of pulling the plug um, and moving, moving down to the U.S. where they can get that better return. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, the next item, which is being seen as a kind of a response to the IRA, um, the fall economic statement. Yeah, so, so yeah, as I was mentioning, some folks were kind of uh, waiting for a response from the Canadian government to, to the release of that uh, of the IRA in the States. Um, and this is being seen as a, a bit of a start to that. Uh, so this is the newest item that we'll talk about today. Uh, pretty, pretty hot off the press still, um, came out in November. Um, and yeah, fall economic statement. So uh, a few things in there, but the big items that we can talk about today are... Um, the Canadian Growth Fund, uh, which was first uh, mentioned in the budget for 2022, um, it has been reconfirmed. Um, the fund will, I guess the, pur the purpose of this fund is really to try to offset the private capital risk that comes along with investing in energy or decarbonization startups. And so some of the tools that they've put forward um, that would be used under this fund are different forms of concessionary investment, um, including concessionary loans, as well as potentially contracts for difference. Uh, so the fund is planned to be launched by the end of this year. Um, and it's been stated to be about $15 billion. That's what they mentioned in the, the 2022 budget. There's no confirmation or any change of that in the fall statement, but I think it's probably pretty safe to say that this is going to continue to be a, a $15 billion initiative. Um, one of the other items that came up is a $6.65 billion investment tax credit for clean technologies. Um, and so this is, again, something that would be uh, applied to the cost of installation and purchase of equipment. Uh, it'd be a 30% uh, investment tax credit, and it would cover a wide range of, of energy and low emission products, including um, pretty much all forms of renewable power generation, um, as well as stationary power storage systems, um, and, and some heated, low, low emission heating solutions like uh, electric heat pumps or solar heat generating systems. Um, and we also saw that uh, small modular reactors, so small nuclear reactors are included in this uh, credit, um, as well as zero emission heavy equipment. So uh, stuff like the, the type of equipment you would see prob probably mainly in mining operations, um, zero emission vehicles that are not really road vehicles, they're, they're heavy equipment. Um, 
And then we also saw a, an announcement for a investment tax credit for clean hydrogen. Um, it's been reconfirmed from the 2022 budget as well. Uh, this one though, there's still a ton to be determined on exactly what it's going to look like. Um, we don't have a, uh, a dollar value for it yet, uh, but they've come forward and said that they're going to um, launch a consultation period to really determine what it's going to look like, uh, likely going to be some sort of a sliding scale of funding options based on the emission intensity of that carbon system, um, which conveniently is also the approach that got taken in the IRA when they released their hydrogen tax credit. Um, so I think it's probably pretty safe to say, again, that we're going to see um, our, our credit kind of mimicking what we've seen in the States. You know, thinking back to everything that you've been listing so far over the last 45 minutes, I feel like I need to go back and get a degree in finance just to be able to, to understand what's going on and to be able to predict the track of how energy transition itself is going to be going. These two things, finance and energy transition, are just going hand in hand as we move forward. Yeah. Let's, so let's take a, a last look, which is we're going to take a look at uh, 2023 and what are we going to be keeping our eyes open for? So why don't you you go first and you can talk about what what you're most interested in and I'll, I'll wrap up with a couple things that, I, that I'm going to keep looking for. Perfect. Um, yeah, so, so a couple items that, uh, yeah, not exactly new stuff uh, necessarily uh, and, and, and a lot of stuff that didn't happen this year, but we should be keeping an eye on for, for next. Um, the first one is the clean fuel regulation. So this has been talked about for quite a while now, but the final version of it um, was brought into law in June this summer. Uh, and so the, the regulation came into force immediately um, when it was passed, but the, the first compliance period under this isn't until July 1st, 2023, um, which is, is a change from the original proposed date of June of this year, 2022, or the a date that it was amended from, which was December of 2022. So uh, the dates moved around a lot, mainly due to COVID impacts over the past couple of years. Um, but the, the regulation we now know, your compliance period starts next summer. Um, and there's a few, also a few changes on this one around um, what it's applicable to. It's now only set to apply to gasoline and diesel, whereas prior version had it uh, applying to all liquid fuels. Um, but nonetheless, given the changes, uh, we're still gonna see this uh, impact a wide range of industries uh, throughout Canada. Uh, the next item that I've got for to keep an eye on for next year is some new methane pledges and regulations. So uh, around this time last year, uh, Canada committed to a 75% emission reduction uh, from methane from upstream oil and gas operations by 2030. Um, this was kind of on the back of the 2025 targets that were previously announced, which um, have actually mostly been reached. A another shameless plug for us, uh, Marla did just release a publication recently on, on the methane emission uh, reductions in Canada's oil and gas sector. Um, so check that out on the website, but essentially we've hit those 2025 targets already. And so this is a, a new target that we can expect to kind of come into regulation next year. Um, and then finally, the, the last one that I've got on my list is that the Impact Assessment Act is back in the courts. Um, so not a ton of information on this yet, but the outcomes of, of that decision are, are definitely important. Um, and they're, they're pretty crucial in really determining how we're going to reach all of these emission reduction goals. Um, it's one thing for us to keep putting out plans and, and, and regulation, but uh, if we're going to be successful, all of these different plans require projects to get built out and all of those projects that need to get built out require approvals. Um, so the fact that this act is back in the courts really just means that I think things are going to be continuing to move slowly over the next little while, which of course is not necessarily ideal. Um, but aside from that, not a ton to share on this one. We're going to know more in the spring. So, so this is another uh, item to stay tuned for. Absolutely. And the, the ones that I would add to that is um, come from some interesting comments that were made by Krista Freeland when she was down in, in Washington, D.C. I think it was in November one is that that she was intimating that maybe LNG was back on the table for the federal government after all. Um, this would be an extremely significant step and, and definitely a, a change of direction for the federal government. So it's something that we're going to keep our eyes open for, particularly as it, there's a lot of people calling for this since the problem isn't with emissions just within our borders. It's a global problem. And, and, and so what is a global solution? So that's definitely, I, I think, still going to be something that is a very live question in 2023. 
and we're going to keep our eyes on. And the second one that I'm going to keep my eyes on goes back to what you're saying about the Impact Assessment Act, Act, but more broadly, again, simply about regulatory approvals. We need to get these done well um, and transparently, but also relatively efficiently and quickly. Um, We all need that. That's an outcome everybody should be able to share. Um, Again, Minister Freeland was intimating when she was in Washington that maybe there's a need for fast-tracking some projects for the approval process. That will be interesting. We saw that there's money, uh, was it 1.65 billion uh, for improving the regulatory process? So we'll see how that's used. So even regardless of what happens in the Supreme Court to the Impact Assessment Act, I think there's gonna be additional focus on fine tuning our our regulatory approvals process. And that is something that Canada West is definitely gonna be looking at in 2023. So, So you can expect to see our voices heavily in that conversation. Um, we are. We have a couple of questions here. Um, the first is going to be: uh, Are we going to sh- share share our deck and this this entire webinar with people? We can share the deck, but there's not a whole lot that that's on it. But you should be able to, I believe, get that from our website. Certainly, this recording will be made available on our website, and anybody who who registered for the webinar, you'll get a link to where you can find it. Those are the easy ones. Um, one just interesting question here um, was, is all this stuff in law right now? I'm going to go back to the beginning, if I can. Um, is this law? Is all of this certain? Are some of these just sort of maybe want to have? Is, is, is all of it going to happen? Yeah, so I'm just scanning our list here quick to, to, to try to make up my mind on it. But, but I think really the the only items that are 100% locked in right now on this is federal carbon registry. That's set. That's that's uh, that's going forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. That's that's law. That's moving forward. The rest of the stuff is all kind of in that um, that stage of 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 figuring it out. So I think we're probably going to see something for the the cap emission, uh, oil and gas emission cap passed. Um, at some point in the near future, we're probably going to see something similar for for the clean electricity regulations, um, and I guess to some extent, the the carbon capture tax credit is is pretty pretty locked in already as well. Given that they they said it, that you could start uh, claiming credits uh, for projects that started this year, um, but no, most of this is not in law yet. It's uh, it's kind of in that in between stage. Fantastic. Um, one of the things that we've been I mean, we really just focused on the federal uh, legislation and proposals and whatnot in, in this particular thing. We we haven't even touched on the provincial stuff. We mostly no. haven't touched on the international stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff going on, but yet we know that they, they also interact with one another. One of the questions that we have specifically with respect to the offset system, so this goes back to the federal carbon registry number six there, mm-hmm. is how do the federal and provincial offset systems interact? Yeah, I I think my understanding right now is that they don't really. Um, so if you're if you're regulated under a provincial system, you need to obtain your compliance offset credits under that provincial system. Um, if you're regulated under the federal system, you'll need to get your credits under that federal system. And that also completely ignores all the vol- voluntary offset um, credits that are out there for for non compliance, um, non regulatory compliance. Um, options as well. So I think they, they probably interact in that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping there's some communication in terms of how the protocols are developed and, and hopefully some consistency in what's expected in provinces versus the federal system. But in terms of actually interacting between the two, um, my understanding is that, that they really don't. Great answer. Um, there, there's another question in here on something that I know that you and I have had quite a bit of conversations on. Um, this is on going back to the, the clean electricity regulations. I keep wanting to call it the clean electricity standard, the clean electricity regulations. Um, and it, the question was, is there any discussion on rural and remote communities like Fort Chip and its hundreds of thousands of liters of diesel use? And I know that, that you mm-hmm. and I have talked about the fact that um, if it's not att- attached to the grid already, as in this case, it's not under the clean electricity regulations. We have seen some organizations, I think PEMINA, for example, uh, Pemina Institute was arguing that perhaps um, they should be brought under because if we're going to reach the goal of of net zero, that that you need to address this. And and you and I have have also discussed that perhaps bringing those communities under the clean electricity regulations 
was not the best way of actually making that happen. You could still have that goal there of getting them to net zero, but perhaps it was a different mechanism, something more like a carrot or something more tailored to the needs of a small and remote community that would be better than a clean electricity regulation to actually get them there. Yeah, 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 to- totally agree. Um, yeah, it, the, those small communities don't have the same options available to them to to really reduce the emissions from the grid. Um, so, so I, I, I mean, in my opinion, saddling them with some sort of a, a regulatory obligation to hit net zero by a certain date is is just not necessarily fair with what what they have available to them. I think it's it's great to have that goal, but yeah, as as we've been talking about, getting there is probably more of a case of or what we'd like to see is more of a case of of incentives um, and funding options being put forward for those communities versus putting them under the regulation. But but to answer that that question, yeah, those off grid communities won't be impacted by this as it stands right now. That's great. And I'm going to throw in one last question here, which. Uh sort of speaks to something Dylan Kelso put in the chat, but was actually put in Q&As by Aaron Campbell, sorry, excuse me, Eric Campbell, who said, can the provinces do anything to complement federal incentives in the fall economic statement and to further compete with the IRA? So that's the question is, how can the provinces help with the competition as we move forward and all this stuff is coming down the pipe? Yeah, I, I think they can and they should um be be doing some work in addition to the federal the federal stuff that's being set out and i think the the federal government is also expecting um the provinces to do something um along that that those lines as well um we've seen it specifically with the carbon capture utilization um and and storage tax credit that's come out um you know there's been talk from from industry as we mentioned that this is great but it's still not quite enough um and a lot of the response from the feds has been Yes, provincial governments should now step in and and help complement that to to get us up to a more competitive level. So, can they do anything? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think I think the provinces should should be uh, should be following suit and and kind of coming up with their own um, their own programs to try to attract investment. Yeah, and the the, the other part of the answer that I'd put it in is is mm-hmm. why what makes headlines is when the federal and the provincial governments butt heads. We've seen that. We also keep hearing from people in the know that behind the scenes, there's actually a lot of areas in which the federal and the provincial governments are working really closely together to try to accelerate progress. For example, um, small modular reactors would be an an area. Hydrogen is another area. CCUS is another area. There's a number of things where there is a lot of work being done to figure out how to complement and how to work together to not just get the energy transition happening faster, but to get our whole environment to be more competitive, um, to, to keep the dollars at home and, and to make um, make things more successful here, both economically and in terms of sustainability. So I'm I'm really enthused by those. Brendan, yeah, you have done- Cooperation this- does exist, re- regardless of what, uh, what uh, yeah, headlines would like you to believe. But. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to let everybody go in just a minute. Brendan, you've done a fantastic job summarizing 2023. I suspect we're going to have to do this in 2024 as well, because so much has been happening. Thank you all for listening in for what was an incredibly information dense hour for the rest of you. Um, and we look forward to the holidays. Everybody stay safe, be well, stay warm, and we'll see you in 2023.